Um, I'm so excited to welcome you all to this panel today. Um, first of all, I'll do some quick housekeeping. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you already are used to these online panel events, but as usual, um, if you're having any problems with um, audio, please do let us know in the chat function. Um, you won't be able, you won't be visible or audible during the event otherwise, but you can make your comments um, using the chat. So I'm really hoping that everyone will get stuck in and ask questions in the Q&A function. Um, there's also a transcriber doing live subtitling of the event, and you can access these by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you want to tweet along, please do so by using at Ada Lovelace Institute, and um, all our panelists have hashtags, and I encourage them to share their hashtags if they want to. Um, so moving on to today's webinar, um, first of all, my name is Mavis Machirori. I'm one of the senior researchers at the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, and the Ada Lovelace, uh, for those who don't know, is an independent research institute with a mission to make data and AI work for people and society. And we're established by the Nuffield Foundation um, in 2018. And um, this is in collaboration with uh, a few organizations such as the Alan Turing Institute, the Royal Society, British Academy, Royal Statistical Society, Wellcome Trust, Luminate, Tech UK, and of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. And our work covers many different strands, including ethics, public engagement, public sector technologies, and more. But today's webinar is brought to you by the Health and COVID Tech Program. Um, and I think just a, a quick spiel on why this webinar is really kind of important to all of us here um, on the panel is that, as everyone now knows, COVID is the first pandemic of the algorithmic age. And there have been so many solutions that we've seen being deployed to kind of deal with this crisis. And a lot of them have incorporated data-driven technologies, a lot of them um, at scale and quite quickly as well. And so this has brought in new opportunities, but also new risks. Um, examples of slash technologies that we've probably all interacted with include um, public health identity systems, contact tracing apps, um, and obviously the kind of linking of a lot of, a lot of large um, health data stores. But there's a real risk, I think, in all of this, that there are social inequalities or inequalities in health that are expanding, some new ones, some exacerbating um, already existing um, previous ones. Um, and from, for all different reasons, and I don't think we can specifically say this was the cause, but for a lot of different reasons, a lot of the kind of ways in which these technologies have been deployed are actually exacerbating inequalities um, to different scales for different um, communities. Um, and so tools such as symptom tracking, like I said, or digital contact tracing um, apps have actually kind of marginalize some members of the community. And one of the worries is as we start to deploy machine learning and um, AI systems on top of already existing kind of inequalities and the ways in which our public health structure currently is, this is going to get worse. But the whole area is also complex and messy. Um, what we can't do, however, is sort of sit back and say, well, someone's going to fix it. Um, and this is why the Health Foundation and Ada Lovelace partnered together um, in 2020, uh, 2020 to start to look at what was going on in this space. Uh, and what we've been doing is a partnership project that has been asking questions around, well, how have data-driven technologies been interacting with um, social and health inequalities, well, inequalities in health? And some of these have a social determinant. Um, and this is only a small part. This is only, we've been doing work across four different work streams. We started off with the data divide, uh, and we can put that in the in the chat if you haven't already come across it. Um, we're doing a landscape review, which is looking at the decision making that has happened within COVID. Um, we're looking at the actual experiences of members of the community working with an organization called Apple Collective um, to really kind of map out the ways in which these technologies have interacted with people's everyday um, lives and experiences so we can tell the story of what technology has been doing. Um, and another work stream that we're also using to generate this evidence is one that is looking at a specific technology, looking at what decisions go in, what data goes in, and what the impacts are on particular demographics. But this is not alone enough. We need to open up the discussion to other fields, I guess, and have a really good interdisciplinary discussion about what it is that we need to do if we're going to design better systems for future pandemics, but also if we're going to take some of these technologies and, and see them becoming the norm. And with that, I've already spoken enough. I am so delighted to welcome our panelists. I'm going to ask each of them to come in turn 
uh, to introduce themselves and give us a short provocation about what they see has been happening in the space. And hopefully this will open up discussion about where we can go for the future. And with that, I'd like to start with my colleague, Josh Keith from the Health Foundation. Josh, would you like to come on and tell us a little bit about yourself and about data strategies and inequalities in this space? Uh, thanks, Mavis, and thanks for inviting me to be part of today's discussion. Um, so I'll start with a few words about myself. So as Mavis said, my name's Josh. Uh, I work at the Health Foundation, uh, where I'm currently uh, Interim Assistant Director of Data Analytics. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the work of the Health Foundation, um, we're an independent charity committed to better health and care for people in the UK. Um, we, we try and achieve that mission through a number of ways, um, one of which is our work on data analytics, which I'm, I'm part of. Uh, I've spent my career working in research analysis with a particular focus on the role of innovation and technology in, in health and care, and more recently specifically looking at the role of data and data-driven technologies in that context. Um, and today's topic, so data-driven responses to the coronavirus pandemic, and particularly the question around the impact of these technologies on existing social inequalities in health is something that's really important to our work at the Health Foundation. And we've been focusing for a number of years on both improving the use of data in health and social care, um, and on the other side of that, the challenge of producing inequalities in health which we know from some of our work and, and work of lots of others have been growing rather than narrowing in recent years. And they've, they've, um, both those areas have been high priority for us for the last five years or so. And that's really the root of the research partnership we formed with the Ada Publish Institute on this topic in which Mavis briefly introduced. Um, so Mavis asked me to talk um, for a few moments around um, the rapid deployment of data and interventions and technologies and their possible impacts on health and social inequalities. And so I just thought I'd use the pandemic as a window to, to look at that, given that the focus of today's discussion. Um, so if we think back to before pandemic, we'd actually already been witnessing a, an increased focus on the role of digital services and data of approaches, such as artificial intelligence across health and social care and beyond for a, a number of years. We'd seen the creation of NHSX, we'd seen the launch of the NHS AI lab with a um, substantial 250 million pound investment and a number of other things across the system that signaled the kind of direction of travel at a policy level. And then over the past um, two, two and a bit years now, we've seen a much more rapid deployment of some of these technologies as part of the health and care systems response to the pressures of the, the pandemic. So from the rapid deployment of remote consultations in, in primary and secondary care, using pulse oximeters to help monitor patients with COVID at home, um, the much discussed uh, contact tracing app that, that Mavis touched on, and then um, kind of a, a step removed from that, the central role that data has played in planning a lot of the response, including the um, identifying um, members of the population who might want to consider shielding because of their being clinically extremely vulnerable and to helping um, deliver and prioritize the vaccination program. So, so data and digital and data driven technologies have been a really key feature throughout that. I guess one of the questions of today is what are we learning from this? Um, one thing we're reflecting on is that the experience has, has definitely shown um, a lot of positivity about the role that data and data driven innovations can play in shaping health and social care. But for all that positivity, it's also really served to highlight and, and maybe even reinforce some things that people have been thinking about before then, the many questions that remain to be answered and challenges that need to be overcome if that uh, innovation based on data and data and technologies is to have a positive impact, and especially if that impact is to be equitable. So, so, so as an example, some of those questions. So how, how do data and innovation technologies exist with existing social inequalities in health? So in, in some of our work, um, including um, work that we've been doing with Ada, we've seen that the development of data-driven tools can both be affected by, but also result in structural inequalities and, and biases. And that's certainly one huge barrier to um, the likelihood of these tools being, if being used at large in the health and social care system, producing equitable um, outcomes. There were questions about access, so there were questions about whether those most in need of improved health and care might be amongst those least likely to benefit from data-driven innovations. 
part of this might be about um, uh, issues of access related to digital exclusion, especially if these innovations are delivered via digital channels, um, but also beyond digital exclusion related to the way which data-driven innovations are developed and tested and evaluated, um, which might uh, further entrench existing barriers to access for health services. So who is not included in the data that is used to develop a data-driven innovation, for example, will have implications for, for who that innovation will work um, well for and who it won't work for. Um, and, and another thing that we've seen during the pandemic is the really rapid nature of innovation, which is uh, a, a real challenge when it comes to, especially to new approaches using new technologies. And it's one of the, the, the questions that a lot of people are, I guess, grappling with at the moment is, is how do we reconcile the speed of innovation and of deployment of those innovations with making sure that approaches to um, evaluation and testing and deployment do include the time to build evidence and, and be more certain of the impacts, um, impacts generally, but particularly focused for this discussion, how, te how technologies might work differently for different groups or in different contexts and balance that, the risks of innovation, but also with making sure that um, the opportunities to bring these benefits to everyone can be, um, can be realized in a, I guess, timely manner. So not, not, none of these things are easy or have a straightforward answer. Um, definitely some of the things we've been working on with the Asia Lovelace Institute. Um, one thing to, to reflect on is that um, we need, I think we need better evidence of the impact of some of these technologies, but also better understanding of the multiple different routes in which inequalities might be impacted by the rapid development and deployment of technologies. And, and crucially, what kind of, um, responses and approaches work to address and mitigate some of these um, issues. It's one thing to highlight the challenges, it's a much different um, uh, the fish to, to then set out how those challenges can be actually overcome in a, in a practical way. And then a, a final um, thing I wanted to uh, draw out was just around the timing of this discussion we're having today. Um, so you know, at the moment, the policy focus is shifting increasingly um, away from Kind of dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and response to that and focusing more on building on the use of data and data of innovation as the system moves forward so we saw maybe two weeks ago maybe three weeks ago now the final data strategy of health and social care published um i think there's a, a, data, a digital health and care plan coming at some point from from an hs transformation directorate um health disparities white paper at some point in the summer so lots of strategies that and policies that are very relevant to today's discussion um, and that make the, the conversation mapping really relevant and it's I think really important that um, as we move forward into the kind of implementation phase of lots of these strategies and plans that the, the lessons from the pandemic are really captured and embedded and that's part of the opportunity we have um, so that's it for me uh, maybe hope that's helpful yes Thank you so much, Josh. That's a really great starting point. And I think leads quite nicely to some of the work our next panelist um, has really been trying to drive forward uh, that issue of inequalities and how we address it and who comes in to help us address that, I think is something that um, I'd like to really hear from. So I'm really delighted to pass the mic over to Tina Woods. Um, and Tina is going to tell us a little bit also about herself and the work that you are doing and what you've sort of found within the pandemic and how we can think about some of these issues that Josh has raised, for instance. Tina, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mavis. And, and of course, um, it's been you know, so wonderful working with you and, and Josh um, on some of the work um, together. So um, as uh, some of you know, I, I wear quite a few hats, but they all sort of coalesce uh, around um, really this need for pretty bold system change um, uh, to, to kind of really to take what we have effectively as a sick care model that we have at the moment to try and to try and sort of uh, initiate the changes that we need to see to really drive a more sort of preventable sort of uh, sort of equitable equitable sustainable health model um, so that's really where a lot of my my work has been focused on so um, I run Collider Health um, I also run a social venture called Business for Health 
Um, I just today, um, uh, announcement was made, I'm going to be the, uh, working with the National Innovation Centre for Aging on, uh, on sort of healthy longevity and creating a whole new sort of focus around what that is and how we can um, really drive change in that whole sort of arena. Um, but I think really what we saw with the pandemic, which is what I think we need to see now, it's this, the burning platform for the pandemic was we literally have to save lives, you know, and we all had to work together really, really quickly and obviously saw a huge amount of um, energy um, around a shared purpose. And we just kind of clubbed together and just got shit done, basically. Um, we just had to do it. And I would argue that's exactly what we need to be doing now. And the burning platform for change is that we have a really ill population. And that was one of the reasons why we were so hard hit from the pandemic. We need to see that same urgency and, that, and see it as a platform for change. If you look at some of the, the extraordinary figures, I mean, in 2000, you know, uh, uh, you know we spent about, um, I think the figures were, uh, yes, 27% of day-to-day -day sort of um, public service spending was on health. By 2024, it's going to be 44%, 44% on NHS and care. So that means less money available for actually all the areas that we really need to focus on to actually improve health. Because what we are seeing, we have a chronic um, um, ill health epidemic. And, and it's rooted in all, and it's rooted in actually these wider systemic inequalities that have really sort of been exacerbated and have really sort of startled us into some action. Um, so we need to really focus there. It's the 80% outside of NHS and care that we really need to be focused on. Yet our spending, it's, not, it's going to be reaching 44%. That has to be our burning platform for change. So how are we going to do that? So, of course, data is part of um, the solution. And we've seen that with, with, um, with COVID. And we've seen amazing stuff happen with COVID. So we've got to bottle that up and sort of learn the lessons before we go back to the old, old, uh, the old way of doing things. We cannot do business as usual anymore. We need far more bold solutions. So that's really what I'm really looking to do. So the question that I was asked was, you know, how data can play a role uh, for a more equitable public health infrastructure and looking also at the role of private sector um, um, in, uh, enter enterprise and health data use. So, um, so for data to really work, I mean, I think the thing that comes up over and over, we have to trust who is using our data. So we act for the most part, actually, you know, people do trust our NHS and care system with our data. But I think, um, uh, and so, but we all, so we do need, and this is absolutely paramount, we need a, the general public to feel comfortable and to feel that they can trust who they're sharing their data with for public benefit. Um, and so the underpinning sort of data environment and architecture has to be obviously interoperable. We have to be able to share data really easily. And that's still a real conundrum um, to get <laughs> to kind of, you know, sort it out, um, but it has to be trustworthy. So, so this, uh, so some of the work that I've been doing has been all around that. How do we create this trustworthy system and how do we actually tap into the vast amount of data that really isn't getting recognition actually. And that's that 80% of the data responsible for the, for the determinants of our health. So, um, so looking at um, what we called private sector derived health relevant data is a really, really interesting area. And of course, combining that with public sector data, and it's not just in NHS and care, it's also other sorts of data. It's also administrative data. So people like Ian Buckman up in Liverpool have done amazing work with their civic data cooperatives and CIFA, really harnessing local, local intelligence, public health bodies, you know all the all the actors and including this, this you know this this the, the the citizens you know who live there they did really really well with with how they responded very quickly to the epidemic so we need to kind of harness those sorts of um uh experiences and also potentially data models to be able to do that sort of this federated kind of data model so these are all the sorts of things that we started to look at and i'll mention one project which is the uh, the Open Life Data Framework Project, which was really sort of um, initiated out of this recognition that there's this wider data ecosystem that we have to understand, because it will also hold some of the clues to actually understanding, A, where the inequalities are, but also, more importantly, the solutions for that. So we published this framework. We took some lessons from other sectors, you know, for example, um, we worked with Gavin Starks, the open, uh, who's former CEO of, of the Open Data Institute, but also co um, was a co-architect of open banking. And of course, some of you will know that open banking, you know, is driven by regulation. Of course, we have on, a, you know, around the corner is a huge amount of um, energy that's going to be focused on agile regulatory reform on data to kind of make the environment post breakfast more agile and responsive to opportunities, etc. So this, so in a parallel sort of way, this is exactly what spurred open banking, which and the whole intention around that 
was to open up, um, you know, was looking at GDPR, but also some PS2 financial regulation to open up the data ecosystem, make data more portable, say, listen, banks, you don't own data. It's actually belongs to the, the customer. We want to make it easier for them to choose who they decide to bank with. So it spurred up this huge um, in fintech ecosystem, challenger banks. And, you know, and so, of course, they have the same issues in many ways that we have in our health space in the sense that, yes, you know, you know, consumers, they don't want their, their banking data to sort of, you know, get abused, you know, and the same, so, so some of the sensitivities are actually quite equal. So the, so the trustworthiness of the system, I think there are many, many sort of um, uh, lessons that we can take from that. So that is indeed what we did, sort of looking at the Open Life Data Framework, which incidentally was published um, uh, in, in November with the support of our uh, George Freeman, our Innovation Science Minister, who, um, you know, is, 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 is incredibly sort of excited about some of the opportunities for us as a nation to be able to crack, you know, um, the leveling up missions, which has seen a recommitment to healthy life expectancy, but most importantly, it's a reduction of health and well-being disparities. So, um, so what we did is we looked at this framework and um, uh, looked at how we can create this trust, you know, this trustworthy system, you know, consent-based mechanism. So we looked at all that, it's been published, and we're now hoping to take that into an a, um, other sort of uh, a way to test out some of these ideas, because in the end, you need to test stuff out. You need to see whether it really works in the real world. So we've got a number of use cases we're looking at. Um, but I think importantly, one of the things that we want to do is, and this is very much part of some of the, the regulatory reforms, you know, potentially at play here in, in data, for example, is to take, um, is, is to look at initiatives like the government are looking at the moment with smart data, for example, how, how to make it easier for individuals to share their data held by private companies with trusted third parties. Parties, um, and how do we and how we can inform interoperability standards to make it easier to share data to support innovation. So one of the ideas that I'm looking at, you know, this is my work with the National Innovation Center for Aging, is actually to create sort of you know these sort of you know these healthy longevity scale boxes in the same way that we had in, in fintech. Is actually look at these cluster of organizations working with public sector, working with you know the, all, the whole myriad of actors, you know, that we need to be working with to come up with insights. Um, to understand where the disparities are, but, but, but actually fundamentally is to develop the solutions to that, um, you know, and potentially looking at, um, you know, and of course, AI, how do we harness AI? So, um, and I think there are some huge opportunities, you know, if we, if we look at the national AI data strategy and the national data strategy, that's very, very focused on NHS and care data. So there's a massive opportunity, and this is some of the work that I'm going to be doing to really look and see how it can be much more bold and radical in terms of where health, what health actually means and where health is outside NHS and care data. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I think with the NHS and care data saves lives strategy, which actually philosophically, I think says all the right stuff. Implementation is the hard part. I think implementation came up a couple of times. So yeah, so we have to look at how do we come up with new data sharing models where we can also, we can also harness private sector data um, you know, for public benefit, you know, what are those commercial models going to look like? So there's a whole bunch of work ahead where we have to test out some of these use cases. Um, now, I'm just going to say a word to some of the other work that I'm doing, which is very relevant, which is the business for health work. And we're taking um, some of the thinking out of data to feed that into the development of what we're calling the business for health index. We're working with the CBI. We have support from um, Chris Woody, our CMO. We're working with the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. In fact, we're sort of submitting evidence and case studies as we speak. It's just about to be published. And what we're looking at there is, okay, hang on. We've got the business community. This is part of a, the massive solution that we need as part of a system change approach. How do we get the business community to do more to kind of reduce that NHS and care demand? We know that mental health, musculoskeletal, there are massive areas where business can uh, dramatically reduce demand. So we're looking at the development of a framework, working with the owners health index team. So we want to line it all around that. Health is an asset to invest in. Um, we're looking at the role of business in workforce health massive area, the CBI, we're, we're literally about to develop a diagnostic for launch in November, uh, you know, work, improved workforce health and actually good quality work leads to good health, health equals wealth, how do we support local employers, local businesses to do more for their local populations with good quality work, with good access to jobs, that's going to drive up health in local communities, that's exactly where we need to be with place-based place health role of social enterprises, charities, working together, solving problems in local communities. So that's a fundamental part of what we're doing. And of course, products and services, food systems, you know, ultra high processed food, massive area we need to tackle. We eat way too much junk food. Housing, we need much better housing. These are all ways in which the business community can be incentivized. And, and lastly, I will just say the big idea behind that 
is um, uh, bringing health re really into ESG investment and innovation. So massive energy and, and capital existing in, for example, the pension funds, institutional firms, there are new regulatory um, freedoms being given to pension funds to invest in higher risk innovation areas. There are trillions of capital that could actually be invested into strategic projects to deliver more on reduction of health disparities and making it worth their while in the same way that we see in climate and ESG in, uh, investment in net zero. Let's do the same for health. Let's get the big, big money to actually invest in reducing health disparities because it will lead to health um, equals wealth for all. And we will improve you know, our prospects as a society because we'll be in, in better health. So I could go on forever, as you can probably tell. There's an enormous amount um, that needs to be done, but we need to be really bold. And we really, really need to look at the wider reasons, the other reasons why we are so ill. It's not about NHS and care systems only. It's a much bigger thing than that. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tina. That's a really great provocation. Um, I'm starting to think our webinar should have been maybe three hours long because there's <laughs> definitely lots to talk about. But it's a great point that you make, right, about we need to think more beyond sort of the um, the usual determinants of health and really think about what else people are needing, um, not just access to services, but people need um, clothes and they need food and they need to be able to pay their gas prices. I think these are all issues that come together. Um, but one of the things that you said was about communities um, and being able to not lose that momentum and have you know system change. One of the critiques that sometimes comes up is when we think about data-driven systems is that the focus has really just kind of been on innovation within the NHS, for instance, or is very UK centric. And sometimes I think we forget that actually the pandemic and some forms of data-driven systems continue to be deployed outside of the UK system. And you, talk, you talked about you know, transparency as one of the mechanisms in which you can think about doing this better. And I'd really like to hear from um, Kira um, as somebody who has a more global perspective about you know, what you, you can reflect on what you've heard Josh and Tina say, or more in terms of you know, the research um, expertise that you bring to your work. And just tell us a little bit more about how you see COVID unfolded, where the gaps are, um, and yeah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Mavis, um, and thank you to uh, Tina and Josh for setting up this conversation nicely. Um, so my name is Kira Staunton. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for Biomedicine, uh, which is in uh, York Research, and we're located in Bolzano in the north of Italy. Um, and so for the last two years, well, generally, we look a lot at um, the governance of health data, supporting the scientists at our institute. Um, but in the last number of years, our group has been looking more on the ethical and equitable use of that data. Another hat I wear is that I'm a consultant at the South African Institute, uh, National Institute for Communicable Diseases since about 2018. Um, and since then, I've been working with them on the management of its data for public health, um, particularly in the context of TB and HIV. And of course, some COVID conversations come up. Um, now, when we look at COVID, you know, it was our first digital pandemic. Um, as with any pandemic, we were heavily reliant on data. But there was also this emphasis that um, Mavis mentioned on digital technologies to help us understand, control, limit the spread of uh, the virus. But equally, these um, data and these technologies, they were used to very much limit our rights and freedoms. Um, now, we've seen a lot um, in the discourse in uh, recent months and particularly in the last year and what went wrong and what we've learned. And today, when we're talking about designing a more equitable health and social care system, I'm going to focus on data intensive research methods, which is very much the area of research of minds, and the problems that are occurred that are inherent because of the, uh, that they're inherent in our current global health research um, systems. So, very much with this framing, um, there's three points I think I'd like to make. First, the current system is not delivering the data necessary to ensure equity benefits. Second, a lot of the problems we are seeing is arising due to the open science and data sharing research agenda, which is very much serving uh, Western um, and particular communities within Western society um, exclusively. And third, um, one of the conditions for equitable use of this data must be, having, must be resting on equitable access to the benefits of that data. And as we saw during the pandemic, the current systems is really not meeting that. So if I take it off with the first point in looking at our global health system. 
Um, historical global health inequity has meant that we, uh, we've, we've heard a lot that research is being predominantly focused on diseases in high income countries. And because of exploitation, uh, discrimination, a lack of trust, and a host of other socio historical reasons that there's been a reluctance of some groups to participate in research. Now, our research can only be as good as the data that we used to feed it. Because of these problems that we've seen from, from exploitation, discrimination, and so on, we're seeing that there are gaps and thus biases in our data sets. So there's an underrepresentation and at times misrepresentation of many population groups. And therefore, research and the outputs of research not targeted um, at these groups. And again, we saw this, uh, this happened again when it came to the rollout of COVID um, uh, trials. Now, if you look at the second point that I'd like to make um, and how this all sits in with the current open science research um, agenda. At the beginning of the pandemic, we heard from governments, funders, scientists, importance of share, share, share. You know, it's importance for solidarity that we share data for research. And we saw that the quick vaccine development uh, has been very much credited in part to this global data sharing. Uh, and while that is the outcome was good, um, when we actually began to look at this data sharing um, and open science agenda, it has been and always has been set by high income countries who have the access to necessary skills, infrastructure and personnel to ensure that the, um, that enables its researchers that are based there to benefit from this data sharing. Now, we began to see, particularly last year, a pushback from to this open data sharing for many researchers, particularly in Africa. And this pushback um, was in part due to this asymmetry in infrastructure resources and capacity that we see between high income countries and low income countries on data generation, storage, analysis, and so on. Now, these asymmetries very much have the roots in this exploitation that I mentioned, inequitable funding, racism, and other forms of um, disenfranchisement. But it's what it means ultimately is that the current data sharing agenda and research is principally serving those who have their necessary resources in place to quickly use and um, exploit the data. Now, this brings us to the third point, equitable benefit. Um, and when we're talking about access, access to data, but what about the benefit to the outputs of that um, data? Now, the work that we were doing, we're very much arguing that access to data must be tied in some way to a clear benefit. Um, and so benefit and benefit sharing must be key in any data exchange. Now, I mentioned solidarity um, and the calls for solidarity. I think even one of the COVID trials is called solidarity. Well, solidarity very much has its roots um, in genomics research. It's being urged that it should be a principle to guide gen genomics research and also now other forms of data intensive research. And absolutely, it's a very much a laudable concept, but COVID demonstrated that to rely on this principle alone is not enough because solidarity will be continue to be exploited as it was in the pandemic for national and commercial interests. And if there is no, uh, particularly if there's no clear, and I would argue a legally binding process in place to ensure equity of be benefit. Because while we did have solidarity and people were happy to share their data for um, this public uh, global benefit, but when it came to the distribution of vaccines, for example, and also the pricing structure around this, solidarity stopped and the national and economic interest very much took over. Now, looking towards a more equitable and health and social care system and how all of this kind of fits into, like, you know, imagine the future. I would argue that an equitable health and social care system must be uh, supported by equitable global health re research. Um, and if we have, when we look at this current very much neoliberalist, as some would argue, approach to science does not change. These issues are going to continue to arise during normal times and of course arise during any pandemic times. Now, in the context of research, we've had lots of solutions posed to um, remedy a lot of these issues that I've mentioned, um, such as establishment of academic research centers across the globe, programs in data science, training on personnel, ensuring that countries have the necessary infrastructure in place to support the science. And also it's, what's key is that there is robust governance in, in place to support this data use for research. But a real issue lies with power and who holds the power in terms of decision-making and funding. Now, funding is critical to improve and address a lot of these disparities and issues that I mentioned, but funding cannot and should not be dependent on the decisions of a philanthropic organization 
or funding in industries or agencies that are, are in high income countries alone. And equally, the benefits from science and our data sharing cannot be exclusively led by commercial interests. And I think what's important though to remember is that protection of fundamental rights and interests and commercial interests are not mutually exclusive. What they do is require, and when we're considering and conceptualizing this you know, ideal future, what we need to think about is how can we carefully balance these rights and considerations of all those involved in the data pipeline to ensure that there's benefit for all and that those um, data donators um, and those who are data collectors are not exploited. And so just to conclude, what I would say is that when we are thinking about this future, equity must now be prioritized and at the heart of our data-driven responses. And this will ensure that we're best placed to effectively respond to the next pandemic. And this requires equity in resource allocation, funding streams, but finally and importantly, equity in terms of power and in all power around decision-making. Thank you so much, Kira. Um, so I'm hearing strands that connect so far all our panelists talk so solidarity, public benefit, equity, transparency, who benefits doesn't just stop at the data driven technology, but it also comes even before that in terms of the research and the data that goes into it. And we can't just be insular and looking at, um, you know, just local or national, but we need to broaden this out because everybody benefits when we sort of have this global agenda. But I'm just wondering what this looks like and what regulatory mechanisms need to be in place or what standards need to be in place for those people who are trying to design these systems. And this is where our next panelist, Alison Gardner, is going to really focus on. So Alison, I'm really delighted to have you next on the panel and to tell us a little bit about what you think. You're currently on mute. <laughs> and while Alison is on meeting, um, I really encourage you to put Put some questions in the chat. I know we're quickly running out of time, but it'll be great if we can um, open the discussion up. Alison, over to you. Sorry about that. It would be me. Um, hi, I'm Alison Gardner. Um, I, like many of us, wear many, many different hats. I currently work in the multi-agency advisory service, which is a, a cross-regulatory forum for the CQC, MHRA, HRA, and NICE. Um, and you know, a lot of positive work going on there. I also uh, am one of the co-founders and directors of Women Leading in AI, and we're doing a great project at the moment with Equality Now, looking at uh, an, um, a universal charter for digital rights, and um, and a researcher with, at Keele University. And it's probably with the latter two hats I'm going to speak today, but I also work on a variety of standards um, committees and development of standards with a main focus on healthcare and all that to do with AI. And I was asked to talk about how um, you know standards could be used to help um, you know well regulate and, and make sure that in, innovation is done in an equitable fashion um, and it is with that that I'm going to address a number of blockers that I often meet when discussing an ethics by design approach for AI solutions which occurs even in normal situations let alone in the heightened situation of an emergency Firstly, the common um, rebuttal um, that any regulation standardization, standardization can do is that it will inhibit innovation. It doesn't. It does inhibit poor, irresponsible and unethical innovation. As the introduction of the GDPR produced when we lost quite a few apps, well, those apps therefore were not data, you know, privacy first apps then if they couldn't cope with the GDPR. Um, but Innovate in, in regulation standardization does promote good quality human rights protecting fair innovation. So if you automatically default to regulation inhibits innovation myth, then I think some self reflection is required there. And in light of that, I have to say that we need to move away from um, the bro tech style of move fast and break it um, fashion of technological development, which some might think it suits um, emergency situations, but actually I think it can be harmful and we need to move towards a collaborative, robust, reproducible and ethical uh, methods of innovation. And all we all know, don't we, that key to this is minimizing bias in order to reduce discriminatory outcomes. Uh, to in, in order to avoid hard coding inequity into all our technical systems. And I will say at this point that I'm not really going to comment too much about data because I think a lot of focus is on data, but you know, bias and, and harmful outcomes can be actually embedded throughout the entire life cycle of developing a model 
I mean, you know, even if you think you've got the most equitable and fair data set ever going forward, you can still actually inbuild and bias into a in, into a model if you're not careful. And so one core method to ensure that we correctly identify bias and mitigate for it is, of course, to ensure that we have diverse and accessible uh, multidisciplinary and human centric design. Which leads me to a second myth I come up against a lot, um, which is that um, requiring meaningful and full life cycle input from diverse stakeholders will inhibit startups as it is difficult and expensive to do. Well, I challenge this. If you want to be innovative, then be innovative. Work out how to make sure this happens. If you can't have diverse teams, then engage with diverse users, implement ethics boards, citizens, juries, etc. Organisations such as Ada Lovelace have produced copious amounts of guidance and good examples. And there are plenty of good examples that I come across within the health sector that embed human centric design into their culture. Um, and the key note actually as a side point for all startups if you're building your your team make sure it is diverse from the outset so that you build an inclusive company culture straight away because if you don't and you try and do this retrospectively it is very difficult to do and often meets resistance and have ineffective policies so talking about standards as we know technology tends to evolve much faster than standards uh, set to ensure such emerging technologies are effective, safe and fair. I always add fair. Hence, we often find technical solutions implemented at pace, even outside health emergencies, before there are any appropriate standards and regulations being developed and you're playing catch up. So it is from, but, but it is from this generation of technical innovations that we've experienced all the problems and harms that can occur. And we now we can take learnings from them to develop the standards that will recognise and mitigate for future harms. So I am a member, as I mentioned, of a number of standards committees, and I've noted a few interesting points. Firstly, standard development often experiences similar problems as technological development, in fact, in that there is a lack of diverse voices, and certainly from, um, you know, citizen-centric organisations and representation from communities that will experience the impact of these technologies more negatively than others. And I often find myself having to speak quite assertively regarding the importance of diversity and inclusion as core principles, and I nearly always forget accessible as well, and that, that I will mention that specifically separately as well. And for such principles to be practically embedded into the standards, not just a tick box, oh yes, we've thought about it, you know, big things, but we have to have meaningful solutions to ensure that this occurs. And that meets resistance. And in one working committee, and I won't name them, we had to list the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals relevant to the plan standards. And of course, SDG 9, which is about industry innovation and infrastructure. Um, and if you go deeper into it, it's about inclusive innovation and sustainable innovation um, but those won't have been the key buzzwords that stuck out when it was suggested um, but I had to argue quite strongly to include SDG 5 which is gender equality and SDG 10 which is reduced inequalities into that standard and this standard was about you know how we produce and you know you know good safe effective and fair um, AI solutions um, unfortunately we had a good chair so I, I won that one and some standards are working very well towards this. So um, IEEE P1703, which is considerations for algorithmic, algorithmic bias, uh, which holds at its core stakeholder engagement and an algorithmic risk and impact assessment. So regarding stakeholder engagement, it crucially identifies two types. So obviously, we've got the development team. Um, from the business leads to programmers and the wider team around that. But it also, as the main group, in, um, involves the impacted stakeholders, as I, I will call them. And the standard implicitly requires that engagement should occur and that monitoring for bias should occur throughout the entire life cycle. And there are other standards in development. So I'm involved with BSI Amy 34971. So you standard geeks out there. So that's guidance of the application of ISO 14971. And you'll all love that risk management for um, medical devices, AI um, software as medical devices. So and that's an addendum to that one. Uh, and the bias is, in, is in written into that one. There is a new standard coming up, the BSI 30440 for AI in health and care. And each and that also considers a um, bias on diversity and inclusion and accessibility, you know, and, and I've and I've been member of these purely to push that agenda to make sure it occurs in the whole life cycle approach. 
Now, in order to make any of these processes meaningful of any sort of ethical solution, I'm aware of the time, Mavis, I'll go as quick as I can, there has to be a go, no-go clause. So if the risks and mitigations are not proportionate and they're um, appropriate, then the tech should not deploy. And there's some good examples of this. The West Midlands Police Force refused to, to implement um, a very expensively designed um, uh, predict policing tool for serious knife crime and because they weren't happy with it. There are so many examples of good practice and the and again within the you know the health sector that is being exam you know there's some examples of that. So Ada Lovelace's um AI um uh data sharing um um, assessment impact assessment is, is a good example. Um, so there's other suites coming up. So ISO IEC SC42 and the Sensen Elect JTC21, also that which supports EU AI, EU AI regulation. But the problem that we have with standards is that by, by very nature they tend to be unmandate, unmandated. So um, although some might be designated and recommended and, and you know formally recognised as, as a gold standard to have and it'd be quite difficult to deploy without them, there is a lack of very specific mandate. And often this is because you're kowtowing to promote innovation demand, um, demands and not wanting to impose upon developer concerns such as IP and costs rather than consider citizens' concerns. And that brings me back to another bit of the blocker, which is, of course, inhibiting innovation myth that it, actually any types of standardisation or regulation or ethical governance requirements will slow down the response in ordinary development, but certainly in emergency um, situations such as COVID. But I think Tina might have mentioned it already, um, or here, sorry, apologies, I've got it wrong. But the vaccine, examples of vaccines shows us that that's not the case. But, you know, the, the, the controls on development of vaccines are really, really strong. They managed to, to develop those vaccines by adhering to all the ethical governance and testing requirements due to the urgency focus on funding such developments and were unable to occur to speed. So there's no reason why you cannot, you know, do technological development ethically at speed in, 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 in difficult circumstances. Finally, um, I will mention the learning advice put forward by a variety of superb researchers and the arguments about the contact tracing apps were amazing for you on and Twitter and, and, and you know, the fights to, um, to do with that. And out of that, such many academic workers come through. So I want to just name check um, or, you know, um, examples such as the UK Pandemic Ethics Accelerator, um, the Observatory for Monitoring Data Driven Approaches to COVID-19 and the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law who reached over out on Twitter in response to this webinar, as you know, um, and there was a lot of learning and key to many of these are requiring impact assessments, be they algorithmic risk and impact assessment, technological impact assessments, extensions of DPIAs, you know, they all mean the same thing. Um, and in those, they're requirements for built-in decommissioning of emergency tools, um, controls the scope creep and dual use and the capability for ongoing monitoring and key transparency. And, and so these are things that we must remember as civil society and academia are vital to ensuring that any technological response to a health emergency is defined, time defined, equitable, accountable. Um, any benefits that occur from the developments for future ongoing use, because we don't want to bin everything, oh, the pandemic's ended, let's get rid of all of this tech now. There's good stuff there, but it should be re-scrutinised and assessed independently of the emergency response to make sure it remains um, ethical. And I believe technical technolo Technological response to crisis is at its core very well meant. And I am actually really confident that regulators and standard bodies are cognizant of the risks and are indeed responding accordingly. And some examples have been named already. Um, and for me, in closing, 2020 in particular was a pivotal year when the issue of fair algorithms hit the mainstream, including the streets of London, where people were chanting against algorithms. Um, and I'll just briefly mention Ofqual was fine. I'm going to defend them because they could chant against Ofqual because they knew it existed because they were transparent um, on their website. So people knew that to challenge and, and exercise their rights. So, so please, let's always not be horrible about Ofqual. Um, our developing regulations and standards are taking the learnings from the recent um, pandemic on board. And I am hopeful we can build the infrastructure for good governance, for rapid ethical responses, so that we are ready for future emergencies. And I shall end there. You, <laughs> only two minutes about left. To jump <laughs> in and say we need to open this up. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to, I think, I'm not sure if everyone's on screen, but um, if we can get all our panelists on screen and we have time for maybe 
two questions. Um, and so I see that we have, um, so just there's a comment in there um, in the, in the Q&A and I'll just read it quickly. Um, thank you. Um, the panelist was wondering, so this is from, um, I won't say the name in case we're not saying people's names, uh, but from JW, um, do the panelists, do any of the panelists have thoughts about the application of Data Governance Act or the Data Act and how it can help support some of the solutions proposed um, around interoperability, standards creation, more equitable health, and is there going an ongoing EU regulatory development um, that can apply? Um, or can be considered in the UK. So we'll start with the first bit, um, really quickly, if possible, in a minute or less. Um, this is about standards and enforcing interoperability um, and the application of data governance. Is there anyone who wants to take that? Uh, Tina, do you want to have a stab in a minute or less? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's there's there's quite a lot in that, and I think um, Alison will probably be able to advise on some of the specific uh, details of that. So yeah, I mean, some of this has been dealt with with the BI standard that Alison had mentioned in AI and in health and care. But I think um, uh, I, I think going back to the principles, but these are absolutely core, and I really really agreed with Alison, for example, on the diversity and inclusion criteria because I think it's it's core principles like that that has to underpin everything. Because um, we don't get that right, everything else will go out of kilter. And so, so I do think, you know, this whole question around, you know, data for what purpose and, and, and really understanding what are we trying to do here with the data? So that, that relates to principles, that relates to what we as a society value. It's, 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 it's all those sorts of questions that need to then, you know, be reflected in the standards. So I'll just, I'll stop there. Thank you. Alison, do you have anything to add? 30 seconds um, or less. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think the intention is certainly there. Um, and, I, and, and the only thing is that I'd, I'd be a little bit resistant to say anything at the moment because there's still lots of work, particularly for the MHRA, just getting things mandated. But there is good consciousness of, of that issue and, and monitoring of that. So I, I think maybe that there is less concern um, but it's about getting the balance right between promoting innovation and ensuring equitable care and, and human rights perspectives as well. But I think the conversations are going in the right way. That's really encouraging. And I'm wondering um, if we can hear from um, Josh and Kira about some of the potential barriers. So we talked a lot about equity and transparency, but what do you see as potential barriers to implementing and um, kind of inequalities, equities, thinking in the ways in which we can design future pandemics, um, either a barrier or, you know, an opportunity, because we don't always want to be negative on a Monday. Sorry, Mavis, do you mind just repeating that again? I just lost you a bit. Yes. So I'm just wondering if you could think of maybe a barrier or opportunity in the ways in which we can start to bring all these together in a way that embeds equitable thinking or a ways a way to reduce inequalities in the ways that we transform the future use of um, data or data-driven technologies. Um, I'll come to you first and then I'll go to Josh. Yeah, I suppose just very quickly and briefly from a governance point of view, which as a legal academic, a lot of my work focuses in on that. I think we actually need to start having equity as embedded as a guiding principle in a lot of the work we do. Um, so in, in the in 2019, in July 2019, and um, I was approached by the ACT Accelerator to develop their governance, data governance framework for the use of their data um, and digital technologies. And one of the key focus for them and the discussions that we had with them and also the WHO ethics group um, who um, worked with us was in ensuring equity equity throughout both equitable access to the data, but also equity of benefit. And that was very, very much um, a guiding principle. And for me, I think that's key um, in, in, in governing data as we move forward. Thank you. Um, Josh, what do you think might be the best, well, biggest challenge or biggest um, potential ways in which we can um, harness these kinds of thinking in technologies? Yeah, thanks. Um, I was going to say, well, one thing I really agree with that Alison was saying is that speed isn't an excuse for not doing things right. And I know I talked a little bit about the speed in my opening remarks. And if, if the right tools and structures are there, then speed is not necessarily is not the, the issue um, and, sh and shouldn't be an excuse for not doing these things. I think one of the, for me, one of the big challenges is bringing is the breadth, uh, broadening out our understanding of health inequalities, but bringing that together in a way that means that 
things can be tackled. So I guess as an example of that, lots of, there's lots of things happening at the moment that are looking at very specific inequalities. So there's lots of really good work, uh, some work led by the NHS Race and Health Observatory looking at um, ethnic inequalities in, in health outcomes. And they looked at data and the, the challenges with ethnicity data as part of that. And, and the Health Foundation, we're partnered with the NHS AI, AI Lab on, on work in that space as well. But that's just tackling, you know, looking at um, in a, a still broad range of inequalities, but from one particular angle, rather than taking, I guess, a more kind of intersectional approach to understanding the different routes to which inequalities might interact with um, data for data-driven innovation. And it's not easy to get that right, but it's probably needed to take us to the next stage, if that makes sense. It makes sense to me. And one of the things that I think has been drawing all of these discussions together is it's not just about the data. It's not just about the teams that are looking at the data. It's all of them together and the conversation that we can have around that. So certainly having a joint up conversation is, is the way forward. Right? We can't just have academics. We can't just have clinicians. We can't just have um, people creating policy, but we all need to sort of be sitting together to, to discuss these. And something that I think Kira um, mentioned earlier was the use of genomic data sets. And we didn't really go into the different kinds of um, data that is being combined to create these data-driven systems. But there's de definitely, I think, uh, a conversation to be had that deals with you know, the quality of the data and the ways in which it's coded, but also the sources of that data and where those inequalities lie and how each of those kinds of different areas come together um, in a cumulative effect to then have these downstream impacts on inequalities. But that is a conversation for a whole other webinar because we have two minutes left only. Um, and so I don't think there is a burning question in the, um, in the Q and A and I won't ask any more for times, but I really want to thank all our panelists um, and I'll give you a round of applause and hopefully everyone else on the um, webinar is giving you a round of applause. Um, it's been really insightful, short but sweet, but it's been really useful, I think, as a thinking for next steps about how we embed all of these kinds of discussions into better designs um, for technologies, because if we don't do it well, we're only going to exacerbate the inequalities that we have seen emerge um, in COVID. Um, and I think if you're interested in any of the work that we've spoken about today, definitely get in touch with either any of the panelists, but also in terms of the work that Ada Lovelace is doing, um, you know, uh, email us on hello at edelavoiceinstitute.org and we will keep you updated on all the work that we're doing. But watch this space because there's a lot of evidence that is coming out to think about the recommendations for um, better preparedness and systems. But yes, I agree with Alison. We need to join up all these conversations. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank George, our comms, and Sohib, also our comms um, leads from Ada Lovelace for helping put this all together. So I hope I see you in different social and media things, um, but at least to me to say thank you again and wish you all a really happy Monday. <laughs>